We've got our BNM250 supercharger down to its most basic components. This one, of course, is the case. This set of holes along the top of the case is used to hold down a carburetor adapter plate. Unfortunately, the pile of parts we purchased did not include an adapter, which means we're gonna have to find one. These blowers had options for single or dual carburetor setups, and mostly for the cool factor, we're looking for a dual carburetor plate. Not that there are exactly a wealth of options out there, but I was able to find this custom billet aluminum adapter on eBay, specially made for a 420 or 250 supercharger like ours. And it seems like a really nice, well-machined, good-looking part. The only issue is that it doesn't fit at all. The mounting flange on the top of the case is recessed in, and this adapter is both too long and too wide to set down in there. When doing research for this project, I had looked at every picture I could find on the internet of a BNM250, but it wasn't until I had this adapter plate in front of me that I realized this case was not like most of the others. The vast majority of them seem to have a flat top, which is clearly what this carburetor adapter is meant for. I was only able to find two examples online that match the style of case we're working with. I was told by a technician at the blower shop that this must be a very early model and that seems pretty in line with some other details like the front cover. I haven't found a single picture online of one like this. I couldn't figure out exactly when these first came out, all I know is somewhere between 1983 and 1992. Of course, it's just my luck that I got the weirder version of the supercharger with harder to find parts. Luckily, I was able to return that billet adapter that didn't fit, and eventually found this on eBay, which appears to be a vintage BNM adapter plate and even has an undercut. It looks like it would fit our case perfectly. I was really lucky to be able to find this thing, and it's actually the only one I've seen for sale. There's just one tiny, minuscule little problem I have with it, and that's that it also doesn't fit at all. Yes, yeah, so the base of this thing does have an undercut, but it's not far enough. It's still too long and too wide to fit down into that recess at the top of the case. So there are really just two paths left for us to take here. We can either make an adapter from scratch, or we can try to get this one to fit. The top of the case has five and a quarter inches between the raised outer ribs, and the adapter is just about five and a half inches wide. The case flange is just a hair over 14 inches in length, and the adapter plate is about 14 and 3 sixteenths. So we're not talking about huge changes here, we only need to take off about a quarter inch of width and 3 sixteenths of an inch of length to get this adapter to sit down in that recess. It seemed to me like the best and easiest way to get an adapter plate to fit the supercharger was going to be to modify this one. But before doing anything that we can't take back, we should probably make sure that there aren't other differences like bolt holes in different locations. We'll run a thread chaser through all of the 5 16 coarse thread mounting bolt holes to make sure everything goes in smoothly, and then use some long bolts to attach the adapter plate. This proves that these parts will actually bolt together, and shows us exactly where we need to do some clearancing. And we don't need to make a lot of room, but material will have to come off of all four sides. I don't really have access to a mill or some of the more ideal tooling to trim this down, but what we do have are aluminum cutting discs for the angle grinder. Aluminum does a really good job of gumming up more standard discs, but these are specially made for the task and should do nicely. I considered setting up some sort of a jig to get just the right cut depth, but we're just gonna mark this and freehand the cut. There are some additional precautions to take when cutting aluminum with abrasive wheels. In this case, we're using a vacuum to try to keep dust down and wearing a respirator. Regular cutting wheel dust and steel powder isn't ideal for you to be breathing in, but this stuff is much worse and there's a lot more of it. The wheels wear down pretty quick, so there's a decent cloud in the air if you don't have something moving that away from you. The shop vac seemed to do a really good job at reducing the number of particles in the air, so we'll try to keep the hose as close to the cut we're making as possible. All the straight line cuts we're making are pretty, well, straightforward, but we did have to be careful not to go too far. 
and removing such a small amount of material can actually get kind of tricky, so we're taking our time going back and forth from edge to edge, nibbling away at just a little bit here and there. Eventually, we started to get pretty close, and I tried to pry the piece off, but it kind of just crumbled, so obviously we need a bit more cutting. And then we'll do a bit more prying, which just managed to break more of it off, so back to the grinder it is. At least it's getting easier to see exactly how far we need to go. Once the cuts finally meet up, the rest of that pretty much falls right off. So, the big question. Does it fit? Well, we still can't bolt it down flat or anything, but from what we can see, yeah, it, it looks like it will. So let's get the adapter back in the vise, and we'll make that same cut on the opposite side. The process is the same, and we'll keep on taking our time to work our way down to that corner, break pieces off as we go, and eventually everything meets up and we have a decent edge. Now we can do another test fit and confirm that the long side indeed seems like it will fit. It's still reasonably tight, which is good because we want as much material around those bolt holes as possible, but uh, it seems like we're right where we need to be. Now we just need to do it again to reduce the width of the adapter. The plate has two threaded vacuum ports, and we're going to need to pull out those plugs so that we don't cut into them. Then we'll get the carb adapter all marked up and back in the vise so that we can get started on those long slices. Like before, we'll work our way through nice and carefully, just about as slow as my patience would allow. We were fully through the first side in about 8 minutes, and once we got to the second side things moved a little bit faster and it took about 6. Again, the shop vac was going the whole time and I kept my respirator on. In the sped up footage, you can really see that disc whittling itself down and spitting out a lot of dust. By the time the last cut was finished, this is all that was left of it. But what kind of shape is the adapter played in? Fortunately, exactly the right shape it needed to be to fit the supercharger case. For the first time, it is flush up against the top flange surface. It is nice and solid on there, but not such tight fit that it had to be hammered on or anything. It seems like those strips of material that we cut off were just enough to make it a perfect fit. That said, there is quite a bit of cleanup work to do. Most of the cut edges are pretty sharp, and some like this one have nasty burrs. We'll go over the worst of those areas with the carbide bit on the die grinder, kind of reshaping things as I see fit. Edges were softened up, and corners were rounded over, some of them quite a bit. This was done for aesthetic reasons, but also to make sure that it would sit nice and flat against the top of the supercharger case. And once everything had been gone over, it did fit quite well. Other than the rough cuts, I assume that this adapter is pretty close to what this set would have come with from the factory. I am really happy with the way it turned out, considering all that we just put it through and how much trouble it was to find in the first place. And now that it's taken what will pretty much be its final form, we need a gasket for it. There was no way I was going to be able to find a gasket for this, so we'll have to make it ourselves. We'll start with a pencil rubbing of the underside of the adapter plate, which we will then cut out. That gave us an accurate representation of the mating surface, but I decided to transfer it to some heavier paper for our actual template. With that cut out, we'll lay it on top of some standard gasket material and trace the outline. We'll punch out all the bolt holes and follow the lines with an X-Acto knife, giving us our final gasket. You may have noticed how bright and clean the adapter is looking in these pictures, and that's because they were actually taken after this next step. You see, the polished exterior was nice and all, but we weren't about to polish the whole thing, so just like we did to the intake manifold before it, we are going to sandblast the adapter. This will give us a nice, even surface finish all the way around, and may even help hide some of the angle grinder crimes. At this point, I was still just running play sand through the blasting cabinet, which is not the safest thing, and I sure wouldn't recommend it, but it was slowly doing the job. The adapter came out of the process looking really nice with this all-over matte silver finish. We'll be going through this with many of the supercharger components so that we have a nice, clean base that paint will happily stick to. 
Next up we've got the rear case cover with a fair amount of paint showing on the outside and some corrosion on the inside. A few minutes in the cabinet completely changed the look of the part and it barely looks like the same one. Next up for a day at the spa is the front cover. Following that, the front bearing plate also got a lot of attention, as did the supercharger's snout. And finally, the case itself will receive some attention. We'll use a piece of red scotch bright to polish up the steel front and rear locating dowels, and just for a bit of insurance, use the die grinder on the inside of the case to clear up any burrs from bolt holes. Specifically, some of the threaded holes for the carburetor adapted bolts had some burrs on the inside edges and we don't want the rotor seals to get sliced up. With those chamfers done, the case is ready to be dropped into the cabinet and receive a very thorough cleaning. As you've seen, I actually decided not to tape off anything on these parts, electing to go over the gasket surfaces and bolt holes. The main focus was definitely getting the paint off the outside of the case, but we did go over every little bit, including the inner rotor surface. With properly sized and broken in Teflon strips on the rotors, I don't think the surface finish should matter an incredible amount because they're never supposed to touch. There should always be a little bit of clearance between the rotor tips and the case. In a real world scenario, does it matter? I don't know, but I guess we're gonna find out. Just like the other parts before it, once the case comes out of the blasting cabinet, it barely looks like the same one. The case went in with all kinds of paint and dirt and surface imperfections, and it came out looking nice and smooth. You can see a bit of the inner surface here. It's hardly pristine, which is why I didn't feel so bad sandblasting the whole thing. With the case done, we now have a whole pile of parts that need to be cleaned and prepped for paint. There's everything that got sandblasted in this video, as well as the intake manifold and a few engine parts that had been done at the same time. We'll run thread chasers through every threaded bolt hole on all of the parts to try to make sure there's no sand caught in there and just make sure they're generally in good shape. The NPT ports will get a tap threaded in just enough to clean them but not cut them any deeper. A few of the threaded holes on the intake manifold appeared a bit suspect, specifically the ones on the front of it, but we're going to come back to those later. Once the intake is mounted to the engine and everything is held still, it'll be a lot easier to deal with them, and I just didn't really want to at this time. The front side of the blower case did have a few threaded inserts that looked like they were pulling out. They did hammer back in when tapped on, so hopefully they're not going to be a problem, but I'm not entirely sure what's going on with them. We're just going to keep moving. Here's a close-up look at that inner case surface. It's definitely not as shiny as it was, but uh, it doesn't feel particularly rough or anything either. And the manufacturer couldn't have been that worried about surface finish because they left this big old raised area right in the center where, I don't know, the casting wasn't machined evenly all the way along its length. We will do some hand polishing on the inside of the case to smooth things out a bit farther and uh, I don't think we're going to get it shiny, but hopefully we can get it to be smooth to the touch. It picked up a bit of shine, though definitely not as much as the machined finish it would have had from the factory. We also did a bit of polishing to the inner surface of the rear case cover and front bearing plate, mostly just for kicks. Once satisfied with that, we need to give all of these parts a thorough cleaning. Between the abrasive residues left from the polishing process and, of course, little bits of sand that are probably still stuck everywhere, we need to wash these off as well as possible. Every part will receive a thorough soap and water scrub, both with a large brush and pipe cleaners so that we can get every bolt hole and corner. We have another bucket filled with water to dunk it in and the hose to give everything a final rinse. Then we'll thoroughly dry each part using compressed air. Since the parts we're working with are all aluminum, we're not worried about rust, but we still want everything very dry before we try to get paint to adhere. When we're finished, we'll set that part aside and move on to the next. Every one of the parts we sandblasted will go through the same thorough cleaning process, and they came out looking great. 
It does get a bit tedious, but we want to make sure there is no sand going through the supercharger or the engine, so it pays to be careful. Following that, we need to prep all of the parts for paint. Unlike the engine, which we painted after it was assembled, I decided to go through piece by piece and paint these parts individually. This involved a fair bit of masking because I wanted to keep paint off of the gasket surfaces as well as the inside of the supercharger. The taping techniques shown here are largely the same as the ones we used for the assembled engine, meaning that we'll lay down the tape, cut it on any sharp machined edges, and fill in larger gaps with cardboard and whatever tape I have sitting around. Just like the cleaning process, it really pays to take your time and mask very carefully. These sandblasted cast aluminum parts should hold on to paint really well, so if we make this thing look good now, chances are it will look good for a long time. Once everything is all taped up, we'll lay it out on a piece of cardboard. I tend to keep these plastic caps from brake cleaner and spray bottles of all kinds because they are great for painting stuff. They'll lift the part up off of the surface and make it much easier to paint everything all the way around. For bigger parts, and to get a little bit of extra height, spray paint caps work great for the same purpose. Once everything is laid out, we'll go around and start painting. I decided to go with the same Rust-Oleum engine enamel cast coat aluminum as the rest of the engine, so everything should match nicely. With clean, porous parts like these, this paint is very forgiving, so we don't need to go super light on the first coat. One of the difficulties I found with using this particular paint is that it's sometimes difficult to tell what has and hasn't yet been painted. It's definitely shinier than the sandblasted finish on these aluminum parts, but in light coats, it can be a bit hard to see it. Holding a light up next to the surface makes it much easier to differentiate between the wet paint and dry paint or just bare aluminum. We're doing this in the garage with the door open because it was windy outside and looking a bit like rain. Still, some leaves and debris kept blowing in, so while the paint dries, we'll try to keep the door closed. These parts ended up getting about 5 coats of paint, with about 15 minutes between each one. The coats were kept moderately light, and more for overall coverage of these complicated parts than to build up a thick layer of paint. We'll leave everything out for a few hours to make sure it is thoroughly dry to the touch before peeling off all of the painter's tape. The parts will still be handled very carefully as the paint is soft and will need a few days to fully cure. In my experience, it seems like three to five days is how long you want to give it, but really the more time the better. That low gloss silver finish is just such a good look for parts like these, and it will help protect them from corrosion in the future. It's even a really close match for that slightly polished aluminum inner surface. I do think the inside of the case will be just fine, but of course, we'll have to put the whole thing together to find out for sure.